the Fire Within Podcast. You need a sustainable plan, the right mindset, and the knowledge and inspiration to stoke the fire within. Just like the Phoenix, you can burn your old habits, never turn back, and emerge completely anew. There are no shortcuts. Welcome, Fire Within Nation. This is the Fire Within Podcast, where we talk about all things nutrition, fitness, and health related. I'm your host, Brandon Woolley, joined by my co-host and producer, Joe. Hello. I want to go over, and this will be a kind of a mini series. There'll be a few follow-ups. Child nutrition. Yeah, this is going to be a fun topic to talk about. Even if you never want kids or you don't have kids, every single thing we're going to talk about still applies directly to you. But we're just going to be talking about it from a child nutrition perspective today. I taught a child nutrition uh, series at uh, at a former job, and all the parents are like, oh, my God, this sounds like me. <laughs> <laughs> and they started implementing the changes, too, and starting seeing some pretty cool progress. I do want to give credit. A large uh, quantity of what we're going to talk about does come from Dr. Kelly Dorfman, uh, who's just an incredible expert on the topic. And she has a really great book out there called uh, Cure Your Child with Food. A uh, fantastic resource. I mean, there's some other information mixed in, but I do want to give credit where credit is due. The overwhelming idea behind this is most most normal child maladies are preventable, like ear infection, picky eating, and all these different types of things. Now, you've had some kids. Or- Two, yep. yep. Currently, one of them is sick. She's been sick for like three or four weeks now. That's not fun. I hope it's not the coronavirus. <laughs> We do have some cases now in North Carolina. I don't want to sound ignorant, but I know that I've heard it compared to like how many people have died from the flu versus how many people have died from the coronavirus. And it sounds like it's affecting mostly people who are older and and currently sick. Okay. um, Weakened immune systems. Weakened immune systems are the ones that are are passing away because of it, which is sad. We'll just wait and see like everybody else. Yeah. It's- couple of main topics we want to hit to hit over the next couple of weeks as we develop this series uh, is can picky eating lead to behavior issues and what is the link between that? Oh, okay. Um, are your kids picky eaters? When they were little, my youngest was chicken nuggets. That's all she ate, man. Just chicken nuggets. <laughs> she wouldn't eat anything else. It was kind of terrible. Maybe macaroni and cheese, too. She didn't like cheese. Like, she just, the chicken nuggets. And well, there's over 54% of children have a chronic health condition, uh, 14 million needing some kind of special health care. And then, with that being the case, there's also a doubling of obesity and diabetes and asthma cases. In the last 10 or 15 years, we've talked about in other episodes that one in two people now have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. That's largely linked to wheat grain and corn, primarily corn and corn syrup. And now we're even running into 14-year-olds with fatty liver. Uh, So this stuff's important. And I think everything we talk about can directly impact anybody listening, regardless of their age. Let's uh, dive in a little bit. The main culprit for kids is something called the white diet. Have you ever heard of the white diet? Uh, I think that's like a party that P. Diddy throws once a year. (laughs) (laughs) That sounds about right. No, that's not it. No, not at all. So what the white diet is, is literally every single main food group that children eat these days are typically white. Uh, So sugar, of course, that's white. Uh, Potatoes, they're white. Chicken nuggets, they have wheat, grain, and corn, and they're white. Bread, which is white. French fries, which are white. Chips and crackers, which are white. Yogurt, which is white. Cheese, which is usually white. Spaghetti. I mean, you get the idea. Right. And we also know that every color in nature is a different nutrient. So if everything they eat is the same color, we know that's all the similar nutrients, which means they're lacking a lot. Right. Uh, There's some pretty significant deficiencies uh, due to this. I wonder if that has anything to do with kids seem to really like stuff to be plain. I can't get my kids to eat anything that's spicy or anything that has a flavor that's not perceived to them as being normal. And I wonder if the vanilla blandness of white is just attractive for kids. It might be. If it has something to do with breast milk. I don't know if there's anything psychological with it. Like, I think it should be white. Yeah, I haven't uh, gone done any research on that. Um, you know what I think it is, though? All those foods that we mentioned are super, super high in, in sugar and caseomorphine compounds that are yeah. addictive. Uh, especially dairy in particular, which which is one of the leading causes of ear infections and things like that. One of the shows we like to watch as a family is AFV, and there was an episode we were watching the other day, and this two-year-old kid-ish was eating some vanilla ice cream, and mom like tried to grab the bowl, and the kid just like hit her and looked at her like she did the worst thing in the world, like, no, mom, no, <laughs> <laughs> and then went back to eating the ice cream. Oh, that's funny. Uh, sugar can be the most addicting 
substance on the planet. And that kid was acting a bit like an addict in that moment. Oh, like, yeah. Don't, don't touch my stuff, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. To kind of preface in, into some of the behavioral issues, if you have spikes and drops in blood sugar, uh, for me, all these high dairy, high sugar foods, of course, that's going to cause behavior issues and supposed ADD and ADHD because their hormones and blood sugars fluctuating all over the map. And that, that'll definitely manifest as behavior issues. How long do you think that the diet like this has been around? Is it like back when like white bread came on the market? Is that? You know, I would, I would think that probably the last 50 years or so. Yeah. Um, it's really, especially when grains kind of took over our diet. I watched this fascinating video. I think it was BuzzFeed that put it out, but they basically sat down a bunch of kids in a test environment and they fed them sack lunches throughout the decades. So it's like, here's what people ate in the 1910s. And then here's the 1920s meal. And then like right around the 80s or 90s, it just went to snackables. Like everything was just something else now. Yeah, was like Dunkaroos, do you remember it, those? <laughs> yes, things that, the things that, uh, you know, fruit snacks and things that are... Little Debbie snack cakes. I think there has been a dramatic shift, uh, especially in the last 50 years. And, and that's where all this ADD and ADHD, you know, I think some of the cases, it, it could be misdiagnosed just from spikes and drops in blood sugar. So think about this. You have a bowl of cereal and a Pop-Tart for, in the morning. Okay which I don't know, you're probably got 50 or 60 grams of sugar. That's insane. And so that's going to spike their energy, right? So they get to school, they're bouncing off the walls on the bus, then they get in class and then they're told to sit still with all that sugar in their system and they can't do it, right? And then when that blood sugar finally drops, then they crash and they're exhausted. They're falling asleep in class and then they're going to call that attention deficit disorder. Now, there may be some actual cases where, where maybe the kid needs some help, but I think a lot of the times it has a lot to do with the food. Right. And that's the, the kind of the premise of today's show, right, is talking about how by introducing healthier options into your children's diet. And we're going to talk a little bit about how to do that, right, because some kids have no desire oh, to try anything other than chicken nuggets. Absolutely. So I was a teacher for four years in the public school system. Before I became a researcher and started working on nutrition and health, I actually had a parent. His name is Paul DeLeo. He's, he was talking about how switching his kid's diet uh, kept him off of ADHD medications and their their uh, behavior uh, improved and all, all these awesome things. And he actually turned me on to like raw almonds and a bunch of other good health foods that I never would have thought. Uh, maybe we'll get him on the show one day. That'd be fun. Uh, super smart guy. I think he's working on a master's or doctorate right now. But, mm. but that's the first I'd ever heard of it. And I went, oh my God, we could actually help kids get off these medications and behave be better based on what they're eating. I and mean, it's pretty astounding. Right. Now, there's a binary system at play here. Anytime there's behavior issues and picky eating going on, it's either something being consumed is irritating the system, such as that out-of-control insulin or actual gut inflammation from dairy and things like that, or something that is needed is missing. Like we talked about, if everything they eat is weight, they're probably missing a lot of key nutrients. Mm -hmm. It was, are cravings oftentimes linked to your body telling you that there's some kind of nutrient that you need that you don't have? Absolutely. You know, one of the most common cravings we hear of, especially women around their periods, is either red meat or chocolate. Uh, so, you know, during menstruation, you're losing a lot of iron. Uh, so, of course, you're going to crave red meat, which is high in iron. I mean, another reason to crave dark chocolate may be the zinc and selenium. Those are really important key nutrients that most people are deficient in. Hmm. And dark chocolate can help with that. Um, Do you think that's why they see an increase in cravings when women get pregnant? Well, I'm sure. I'm sure all kinds of hormones are, are going nuts when you have a baby. So that is a big part of it. Now, some common irritants and deficiencies. So let's say your daughter's just crying, crying, crying all the time. Oftentimes, it's related to high fructose corn syrup. And if your daughter is constipated all the time, they may be prescribed a laxative. And guess what some of the main ingredients in these laxatives are? It's high fructose corn syrup. Mm. So their system's already not working right. They're constipated, which is uncomfortable. And then they're going to irritate the gut on top of that, trying to fix the problem, which isn't addressing the underlying issue. It just helps with the symptoms short term. And there's just this con constant inflammation. And especially toddlers and, you know, or anywhere from infant to two years old, they don't know how to dictate to you, hey, my uh, small intestines is hurting. <laughs> they don't know how to say that. Right. So they just cry. Uh, so a lot of really fussy kids don't sleep through the night, constantly crying. There's something irritating their system chronically that's not being addressed.
Uh, if they have some kind of crazy rash, whether it be a, a skin rash, and we'll get into really, uh, we'll get into details on this. Could be dairy related, could be a fatty acid uh, deficiency, which is really, really common when we see skin issues. Stomach aches all the time, not being hungry is usually related to either lactose or gluten, irritating the system. Dairy, for instance, is going to cause an increase in uh, mucus, mucosal secretion in the stomach, kind of like a feeling like post-nasal drip. And with all of that increase in mucus, of course, they're not hungry. Their stomach hurts. doesn't feel good. So they'll just say, I'm not hungry. But, but oftentimes, it's related to something else. Uh, and then picky eating, one of the main reasons for that is a deficiency of the nutrient called zinc, which when you have a zinc deficiency it actually decreases uh, your ability to taste foods properly. It also changes the acuity of your smell as well. So they may have adverse reactions to, to the way foods taste and smell without that zinc component. And when you add it back into their diet slowly, they all of a sudden they'll be more open to trying new things. Wow. And we'll talk about something called pica. Now, pica is if you ever notice uh, your kid eating really odd things like chalk, or if they just take a chunk out of butter, or maybe they like to eat a jar of mayonnaise. That That's usually a deficiency of something. If it's chalk, it's a zinc deficiency. If it's butter or mayonnaise, it's a fatty acid deficiency, in which case supplementing with fish oil or trying to get some really healthy foods in their diet would help. So when it comes to, to zinc deficiency, how is that white diet in zinc? Is there much zinc in that traditional diet that a lot of kids are on right now? Nope, there's there's very little zinc in that diet, and most kids are deficient in it. And in a little bit, we'll kind of get into some high zinc containing foods. But before we do that, I wanted to talk a little bit about why zinc's important. Uh, first of all, it was first recognized as a deficiency in the 1960s with Egyptian children, and they wouldn't grow properly or develop properly. And they were able to trace it back to that culture and what they were eating in the region, just lacking in, in foods high in zinc. We just talked about it being critical for taste and smell, but also proper wound healing. Um, an immune function. So some people, you maybe you've heard of some, if they get cut, it just never heals or it won't close up and, yeah. and scab like it's supposed to. Now, sometimes that's a zinc deficiency. Other symptoms could be hair loss, skin lesions, developmental delays, and even altered behavior all from zinc. Now, many people are, are at least mildly deficient, but children, especially if they're picky eaters and they stay away from meat other than chicken nuggets and nuts and things like that, they're primarily eating cereals and pastas. They're just not getting that. Right. And the other problem when you have a zinc deficiency is it's required for absorption of other nutrients like B12. So that zinc deficiency could now cause B12 deficiencies and all kinds of other things. That I bring also that kind of snowballs. Right. Exactly. Because everything is linked. Now, let's say your kid has a lot of stomach issues. We were talking a little bit about needing uh, to use laxatives for constipation and things like that. Well, most of the reflux medications, they actually prevent zinc uptake. So you're, you're, they're already deficient in it. Now you're making them even more deficient in really? it. Really? Yeah. yeah so there's my all... kids have always had problems with acid reflux, and they've been on the over-the-counter stuff because they're, it's, it happens for so long, you know, everything's just so inflamed and you try to get it under control. There needs to be a fundamental shift in their diet. And it's that it's probably primarily corn, uh, but also gluten containing foods and dairy are also going to cause that inflammation and acid reflux issues. Yeah. Um, With one of my daughters, we were asked to remove dairy and it didn't make a difference. Yeah. So it wasn't dairy. It must've been something else. Yeah. Yeah, and often it's a little bit more comprehensive than just one food group. It could be a couple things. Almost 100% of the time, if there's a dairy issue, there's also a gluten issue. Almost 100% of the time. Hmm. So if the other side wasn't addressed, they may still see issues. So yeah. you found yourself, you got a kid that needs to take some prescription or non-prescription acid reflux medicine. They've already got a zinc deficiency, and now this is preventing their body from Up metabolizing zinc. <laughs> zinc. Fantastic. Yeah. There may be some acute cases and issues where something like that may actually be beneficial, but I think most of the time, I don't think it's really addressing any underlying issue there. Uh, so just something to consider. So if they are deficient in zinc and they're such picky eaters, it's not likely we're going to get any significant source through the diet. You can start them on uh, supplements if that's something you can get them to consume. And one caution with that, zinc on an empty stomach will always cause nausea. Uh, so you, you want to eat a pretty significant portion of food before you take just a flat out zinc supplement, especially if it's a large amount of zinc. So for high around 15 milligrams is, is probably a good amount. 
and, and upwards of 30 if they're a little bit older, but, but smaller amounts of zinc for children if they're supplementing is better. And Thorn Research is one of my favorite supplement companies. There's some of the highest quality things you can buy. They make a children's basic nutrient supplement uh, that has all of the main deficient minerals that kids have uh, built into uh, one capsule. Now, not all kids will take a capsule. I understand that, but at least it's an option. Now, if that's not an option, this is not going to happen. Here are some of your main sources of zinc through food. So beef, red meat, it's got a ton of zinc in it. It actually has 8.9 milligrams per three ounce serving. So that's, that's almost uh, two thirds of what that supplement was just in, in one, one uh, meal. Yeah. Uh, king crab, seafood, but particularly king crab legs. You know, you're probably not going to feed your two-year-old king crab. That's expensive. <laughs> seafood in general is going to be higher in zinc. Poultry, just make sure it's or at least organic. Beans, I prefer pressure cooked beans, especially if they have any gut issues due to, due to lectin protein, but, but that's a good source. Cashews, pumpkin seeds, and chickpeas. So those are some of your main ones, but, but red meat is going to have the highest content. And those go in order the way you described them. They go in order from the most zinc to the lowest amount of zinc, right? Correct. But all those are pretty significant sources and things you can try and rotate in and, and see if you can get them to eat. So if you can get your kids hooked on hummus. There you are. While we're talking about trying new foods, uh, Dr. Dorfman has a process that she calls the EAT method. The E stands for eliminating the problem food. The A stands for adding one food at a time. And this is going to be trying one bite of that new food every day for two weeks. That's 14 bites. Uh, So for instance, if you want your kid to try and start incorporating broccoli, day one, they're going to have one bite of broccoli. That's all they have to eat. Day two, they're going to have one bite of broccoli. They don't have to like it. Um, they don't have to enjoy it. But if they can tolerate it, by the end of that 14 days, it can stay in the rotation. It doesn't have to be their favorite, yeah. uh, but we're just trying to get them to tolerate it. So what's going on in that 14 days is why you would stick with it and do such a small like one bite a day thing? You're starting to uh, introduce that to their microbiome which is going to start to change and become more receptive. Uh, Also, if it's a high nutrient food, it could be replacing some of what's diminished. And so let's say we're fixing a zinc deficiency, their taste and smell is going to change. Taste buds change over quite regularly. And so with consistent familiarity with that food, they're going to become more and more open to it. Mm. But it does take time. Now that sounds good and easy, but it's not. I've sat with families as, as we tried to do this at dinner time, and some kids are, are pretty darn stubborn. It might take 45 minutes to get them to eat that one bite. But other kids are pretty open to it, and they may just take it right away. But the key is 14 days. Now, if they throw up, that's, you know, that's a little bit different. You know, we don't want to force them to throw up over and over. That, that's a pretty adverse reaction. But if they just don't like it and make faces, that's okay. Uh, so 14 days, and maybe by the end of the 14 days, they may be more okay with that. Um, And if they like it even better, sometimes they go, Hey, you know, I don't mind this, but, and you could try different ways of serving it. You know, it doesn't just have to be like raw broccoli. You can come up with different seasonings and spices and and all kinds of things. Uh, Kid friendly, you know, healthier recipes like for sugar free ketchup or at least corn syrup free ketchup, different barbecue. So, I mean, there's all kinds of things you could do to try different foods. But that's the eat method. You want to eliminate the problem food, let's say dairy, and then you're going to add one of the good foods that they're lacking nutrients in. So if they do have a zinc deficiency, we'd probably want to go off that zinc list. Try red meat, try this, but 14 days. And it, by the end of the year, that's, that's potentially what, 25, 24 new food groups added to their diet. That's huge. Yeah. I mean, that's an entire grocery cart full of different foods that they weren't eating before. I remember being younger and feeling like, I know that I was a picky eater growing up and I can remember times where I would try a new food and it would make me gag. Yeah. Eggplant did that to me, and I didn't eat it for about 20 more years. <laughs> I had one bite of eggplant and instantly vomited. For me, anyways, there's very few foods that I don't like anymore. Yeah. Like, it, it used to be that I would never touch anything that wasn't in the two or three things. But now if things are prepared well, and it, it's I have, I have no problem eating a wide variety of different kinds of foods that... Like 12-year-old Joe would have been like, oh, don't put that in your mouth, man. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 
Yeah, no, I was the same way. But how um, much of it is an acquired taste thing? Because I know there are certain things that I believe are probably acquired tastes that there's just no way that people think it's that good. I used to feel that way about coffee. Yeah. Like when, you, when you're a kid and you first try coffee, you're like, why would anybody drink this? And yeah. then like by the 12th cup, you're like, I want more of that now. <laughs> now, some of that is that chemical dependence. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I love that meme that says uh, something about, thank God for socially acceptable chemical dependence in the morning. That's a cup yeah. of coffee. Caffeine Um, is really one of the only few psychoactive drugs that we give to our kids regularly. (laughs) (laughs) Here you go. Have a soda, Tommy. (laughs) Yeah, but some of it is that changing of the microbiome, the taste buds changing over and starting to replenishing some of the the deficient minerals. And that does over time taste change your preferences and your tastes. And we've talked about that with adults on your show here about how once you start making healthier decisions, decisions that are better for your body, it gets easier and easier to eat those foods and then you actually start to crave those foods as opposed to the really unhealthy ones. So absolutely. This is kind of the micro version of that for teaching kids to get into that sooner. Exactly. This two week thing that works with, with adults too. All right. So you're back at the table with the kid who doesn't want to eat. You got any more tips on how to help get this one bite down? Well, one of the most helpful things, although it doesn't create intrinsic motivation, and you know that this show I try and focus on intrinsic motivation, but you can use a rewards based at least to get them to try it. Yeah. And we've made food charts where it's got every day of the week. If they try the new food that day, they get to put a sticker. And we usually get stickers themed to their taste. Like if there's huge Harry Potter fans, we'll okay. go to the craft store and we'll find some Harry Potter stickers. And that's, I would do anything as a sticker as a kid. Like my piano teacher, if I completed a song, I got I got to pick what color star I wanted. It was amazing. I loved it. Let's say there's seven days in a week. You can say for every five days, if out of seven, that you try the new food, you get a reward. And uh, preferably not a bad food reward like ice cream, but maybe right. <laughs> you ate some broccoli. Here's some ice cream. Here's something um, from the white food diet. <laughs> so it could be like a smaller gift, like coloring book. Uh, we'll go to the movies as a family, whatever it is. I like that system versus all or nothing. Cause if they have a really bad day, they don't just give up. So that allows for some bad days where they're just going to throw a fit and not do it, but they won't completely give up because they want that reward at the end of the week. Gotcha. Those types of charts have worked really, really well for, for my parents in the past. Again, it's not intrinsic motivation. I think at that age, it's going to be pretty difficult to get them intrinsically motivated. It's probably going to take some sort of rewards-based system. What about consequences? You know, Dr. Dorfman goes into detail in her book on, you know, some of the psychological concerns with like punishing them for not doing it. If I, if I recall correctly, she just emphasized that there's an a extra thing they can have if they do it. Right. But not a punishment if they don't. So I like they're not, that. yeah, so it's, they're not going to be grounded, but if they want to get to watch 15 minutes of their TV program, they have to eat first. Right. Or go outside and play. but So you don't necessarily want to punish them. The kid's sitting there thinking, all right, so if I don't eat your nasty thing, I'm in trouble. Like, I'm in trouble if I do, and I'm in trouble if I don't. (laughs) It's the worst game we've ever played, Mom and Dad. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Now, we talked about zinc deficiency. I did want to take a a moment to go over dairy and, and, and milk especially. You know, a lot of, they had all those commercials, does a body good and, and, and all this kind of stuff. Milk does not do a body good. Uh, there's no actual evidence to support that it, it reduces fractures and strengthening any more than, say, strength training. Yeah. In fact, uh, they've done studies where adding dairy has weakened bones and caused more fractures and breaks. And the countries with the lowest milk consumption actually have less instances of fractures across the board. And we know that physical activity is way more effective at strengthening bones than milk will ever be. Now, something else to consider, especially from a behavioral standpoint, is A1 casein is in in cow's milk, which is a caseomorphine. That's right, a morphine compound, addictive quality, uh, causes addiction, altered behavior, and can increase cognitive dysfunction as well. Try and stay far away from A1. It could even trigger... A1 casein, that is, from milk, because it could even trigger autoimmunity as well. So are there types of milk that don't have the A1 casein? You can find A2 varieties, which are from a cow in New Zealand that does not have the A1 genetic mutation that American cows have. I still don't think it's necessarily healthy. It's still going to be a lot of sugar, but at least it won't have that A1 casein in it. You could also do goat's milk. And then, of course, there's the dairy alternative milks like almond milk, cashew milk, macadamia nut milk, all those different types of things. But I would not do oat milk. There was a time where the Got Milk campaign had made it so that we felt like we were doing a great job as parents if we were constantly giving our kids milk. Right. And that was all subsidized and paid 
uh, advertisement and lobbied at Congress. Same thing we talked about with the food pyramid when those yeah. 11 servings of greens came out on the bottom and the scientists had actually put them at the top as the smallest serving. So, And also just ironically white. Yeah. Now dairy causes systemic inflammation of the gut, small intestines, usually what's responsible for ear infections because of that increased mucosal secretion we talked about a few minutes ago. All that increased mucosal secretion kind of settles down in the ear canals and things, and it's just a cesspool for bacteria to breed in. And kids with chronic ear infections, it's either going to be because of the dairy or because of the corn syrup solids in their in their formula. Those two things are going to cause that mucosal response, um, and that's why they're in this cycle of ear infections. Now, here's the scary thing. Kid gets an ear infection. What do they do? They give them antibiotics, which completely wipes out their immune system and microbiome. You're at yeah. square one. They got nothing. It could take up to two years to repopulate your microbiome from one course of broad-spectrum antibiotic. Yeah, and as a parent with kids, there's no way that my kids ever went longer than two years with not getting some kind of antibiotic from going to the doctor. Exactly. But most <laughs> of the time, dairy is is one of the primary reasons for ear infections. Now, this is different than, so we're talking dairy and you're talking cow's milk. Right. This is much different than breastfeeding, I assume. Correct. Breastfeeding is the best thing you could do for your kid, unless you're like on crystal meth or something. <laughs> But, Crystal um, meth breastfeeding. Yeah, that's probably <laughs> frowned upon. Uh, <laughs> there are cases where if you're on certain prescriptions and things, breastfeeding is not an option because you're going to be passing things that the kids shouldn't have. And that's fine. Or maybe you just choose not to, and that's fine too. But every single formula on the market, all of them are going to have corn syrup built into them. So your kid's screwed from the get-go. Now you can go through the trouble of making your own. You know, I had a client saying, well, my doctor said that the kid has to have formula. And if they don't have formula, then... They just have to have it. Well, what did we do 50 years ago before formula was invented? Does all babies die? No. You can use other alternative rice milk, things like that, and, and make sure they have the right types of nutrients. It does take some research. It is a lot more difficult, and I definitely sympathize with, with the parents, especially if they're working. Right. It's going to be pretty difficult. But So most kids are going to be exposed to that, those corn syrup solids if they're encountering formula. But there are some, some ways around it. We won't go into the fine details of that on this episode. Now, let's say we've identified what the irritant is. Just because you remove the irritant doesn't mean they're fixed. It's like when you pull a nail out of your tire, the tire's not fixed. Now air is coming through that hole caused by the nail, and you have to repair it still. So that's where you start adding in the missing nutrients like zinc, fish oil, fatty acids that they're missing in the diet. Are there any options uh, for things like fish oil and stuff if your kid can't do a capsule? Yeah, they have liquid fish oils, and they even have them like uh, lemonade flavored and all different kinds of flavored kind. Now, some kids can't do fish. They have an allergy. I mean, if that's the case, you know, flaxseed oil, there's, there's other options out there. Or just getting them to eat more nuts, avocados, healthy fats uh, can help okay. quite a bit. So we talked a little bit about dairy. Now I want to talk about gluten. One quick uh, sidebar on gluten. Just because something touts gluten-free doesn't make it healthy. For example, sugar is gluten-free. <laughs> it doesn't make it healthy. <laughs> gluten is a protein that helps bind things together. So when, when they develop a gluten-free snack, for instance, they need to add something to it so it sticks together. A lot of times it's something like xanthan gum, which, which for some people can cause respiratory issues. But just because it's gluten-free does not make it a health food. That's really important. Do you think that... Because I feel like gluten coming up as an issue wasn't a thing that I remember hearing about as a kid at all. And probably even in my 20s, I don't remember hearing about gluten. But now it's the new bad boy that everybody's trying to get out of everything. But where was it before? I mean, where did this... You know, I don't think there was much known about it. But here's the thing. Things that contain gluten, what do they also usually contain? Wheat, grain, Wheat, and, grain corn. and corn. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking so... like beer. Typically, if you cut those items out and you're not eating processed foods, there's not going to be much, much exposure to gluten. Yeah. What if it's um, wheat, grain, and corn just trying to blame something else? It's gluten. <laughs> <laughs> you meet people that are like, yeah, gluten really messes them up and it changes their whole life. Yeah. And it's a, it's well, that would be like celiac. So there's gluten sensitivity yes. and then there's celiac. Mm -hmm. Celiac is, this is a major concern. Now that's going to screw you up. But gluten sensitivity, I think most people are probably at least at a small level. A couple symptoms, if you 
may be sensitive to gluten, could be frequent cramping and stomach pain. Now, as a kid, I would have probably been diagnosed as bipolar if they ever dragged me in somewhere. I would have crazy mood swings and like scream at the top of my lungs. It like it's horrible, even into my first marriage. And I wonder now how much of it would could have been contributed to one spikes and crashes in blood sugar, which are going to happen from gluten containing foods because they're wheat grain and corn and those right. really high sugar foods. Uh, but the gluten itself can actually contribute to that too. Uh, the hormonal effect it has. I was thinking about these things that we talk about on the show all the time. And it, it struck me that we don't, we don't often say like, we're not talking about like having a piece of bread and all of a sudden you get these crazy things like mood swings by consuming a diet that's bad for you over a long amount of time. So right. this cascading effect of hormonal imbalance and that will lead to these things that feel very significant, exactly. but and I think that's where a lot of people hear advice like this and think, oh, come on. It's like. Sounds far-fetched. Yeah. It's I'm going to eat bread and now I've got, a, I'm going to have mood swings. Come on. That's not how it works. But but over time, it can uh, alter hormonal behavior and things like that. So belligerent and oppositional behavior in kids oftentimes could be linked to a diet high in these types of foods. And it may not just be the gluten itself. Again, it's that blood sugar response too. Yeah. Because uh, what happens when you don't eat for a while, you get what? Hangry. H- hangry, right? Everybody's familiar with that. Your, your primitive part of your brain kicks in. It just wants sustenance. And, uh, you know, the prefrontal cortex isn't operating as much anymore. In fact, we know that your uh, prefrontal cortex gets cut off from the amygdala of your brain. Uh, so you're just in primal mode. <coughs> Have you ever felt like you were just throwing weights around like an idiot at the gym, hoping to see some results? or after weeks or months of working out, notice that the scale just isn't moving? You wouldn't cook without a recipe. So why would you train or start a weight loss program like the Swedish chef randomly throwing ingredients into a pot? You need a sustainable plan that's science-based and attainable. Fire Within has worked with thousands of clients and helped them reach their goals. So visit firewithinnf.com today. Get yourself the free ebook. Read the testimonials and choose a service that works for you. Choose from services like one-on-one nutrition coaching, one-on-one personal training, and more. Again, that's firewithinnf.com. If you're craving uh, gluten-containing foods in an almost drug-like way, like if the kid's like, I want the cookie, I want the cookie. No, go upstairs. I want the cookie. Can I have the cookie? No, go upstairs. Finish your homework. I want the cookie. I want. I've seen this happen over and over again. And if their diets, the white diet, are mostly gluten-containing foods, they're probably going to have some issues. Uh, Now, here's the crazy thing. It could either cause loose stool, which is diarrhea, or constipation on either end of the spectrum because of the hormonal imbalance. Other things to look at if uh, they're older than age two, not overweight, and they have reflux, that's typically a gluten issue. So once again, if they're older than two, they're not overweight, but they have reflux issues. Uh, there's a high chance they have a gluten sensitivity. And remember my comment earlier, almost every case of gluten sensitivity is linked with having dairy sensitivity as well. So if you've been listening and you either have kids and you're hearing what's going on in your kids and in in what we're talking about, or if you're hearing what's going on in your body and what we're talking about, and you think, man, maybe I have a, a gluten insensitivity or maybe this white diet is contributing to some of these symptoms that I'm having. What do you suggest? Like, what's the next step? Where do you start? Uh, so there's an elimination diet protocol, uh, a trial period. And it doesn't mean they're never going to eat these foods again. Right. It's like we were just talking, right? Like, if it took years to get you in this negative state, if you give up bread for a day and don't see a change, and then you're like, well, it's not bread, that probably doesn't work, right? Right. Not at all when I used to like work out and then go to the mirror and be like, did it work? Just not, <laughs> just not how it works. No, no. <laughs> so what, what typically would be recommended is a two week trial off gluten. And here's what to expect the first week, increased erratic behavior, more screaming and yelling and uh, problems for that first week because their body's in withdrawal. It, we would also take them off dairy and sugar during that time as well. The second week, you'll start to notice improved behavior, better focus, better cognition, things like that. It will improve uh, over that second week. And then as you reintroduce... Can it be a longer detox if it's a more severe problem? Absolutely. Now, and then when you start to reintroduce the gluten-containing foods, you'll start to link uh, which foods are associated with changes in behavior. Often, unexplained headaches can be linked to gluten as well. 
Uh, so if you have chronic headaches and migraines and you're not sure why. Now, it could also be something to the lighting, like LED lighting, because LED lights aren't actually on constantly. They're flickering very mm-hmm. rapidly. But sometimes it's gluten-related joint pain. Remember, glycation of the joints is accelerated by wheat grain and corn and gluten. That would be a tough one for your kid to explain to you. I'm trying to think if my kids would even have the vocabulary to be like, I have joint pain, father. <laughs> Now, and that's more for the elderly. It may it may be able to accumulate enough in kids to, to affect their joints. I'm not super sure, but definitely in the elderly. And that's why a lot of people in their 70s I've worked with, when they ditch wheat, grain, corn, and dairy, uh, they get rid of their arthritis medication. It's such a controversial thing for a parent because of the way we've been taught to get rid of wheat, grain, corn, and dairy, which are kind of the staples that we've been indoctrinated to think these are the things that help make our kid healthy. I.e., who's thrown the most money at Congress. Now, one other important point with gluten is it is strongly associated with poor growth of bones or bone loss. So especially if you're dealing with osteoporosis, osteopenia, because of the leaching of nutrients that happens with contact with gluten, that is accelerating those issues. And if you get rid of those foods, sometimes we can see a reversal of some of those symptoms. Help me understand. So we we made it through that first week. It was a rough week. We've started the elimination diet with our kids. The second week, we start to see improvement in their like their ability to comprehend and pay attention, and and you'll see like improvement in that area. the The withdrawal symptoms should be dying down at this point. During the second week, during correct. the second week, they're dying uh, down. Sometimes it'll go up to eleven days um, of, of negative okay. side effects. Uh, but if you stick with it, which it's not easy, it's it's not easy. I'm not saying this is simple. You just do it, and everything's fine. It's going to be a struggle, right? But if you stick through it, I think the the health changes and benefits are going to be astounding. So you've come out the other end, and things are going well. The withdrawal phases are done. When we get to introducing it back in. You don't want to just introduce back the old diet. No. You're trying to you're trying to pinpoint the things that were causal in the Correct. You could use it for that. And how would you tell? Let's say you were did the elimination diet and you your kid loves corn. Like they just love corn on the corn corn out of the can yeah. or whatever. That's like their go to thing. What would you be looking for when you reintroduce corn to see if, if that could be a, potentially a culprit? I would see mood swings, anger management issues, inability to focus, problems in school, problems getting along with others, short temper, short patience, attention span, all those different types of things. And I would journal what problems are associated with what reintroduction and what foods. This is quite an endeavor. Like you need almost like a spreadsheet as a parent to go through this. No, there's all kinds of maps and trackers out there that that are already ready to go. You could probably download one for free if you just Google symptom tracker for gluten introduction, something like that. You know, I know the Lifetime Detox program has a fantastic one built into that, not just for gluten, but for for any irritant, including corn, soy, dairy. But I would just pick one item every three or four days. That way you can track it down to that. Because most of the time, symptoms don't happen the same time as the introduction of the food. It could be up to 48 or even 72 hours later before we see what's going on, especially like with skin issues. Gotcha. So you don't want to reintroduce a new food every day. No. And then three days later be like, this was it, and it could have been the food from day one. Yeah, you would just want to introduce one food. And you always want to consider other compounding fact or com- or other uh, complicating factors. Like maybe if they had a poor night's sleep or something because they were at a sleepover. So consider other things so we don't just uh, immediately blame it on the food. But but we're trying to play detective and we're trying to figure out what is negatively impact your child. Right. And this works with, with adults too. Now, we talked a little bit about irritants and inflammation of the intestines, especially from dairy. It causes pressure to build up and stomach contents to move be moved as high as the sinuses. So oftentimes it could even be related to sinus issues. Mm-hmm. Very young kids, this can cause food to end up in lungs and even, even compound into pneumonia. So it can be a, a bad issue for kids with, with severe acid reflux. And sometimes having excessive fat around the, the stomach can cause the reflux as well, almost like a, a tumor, you know. But that could definitely reroute things in a negative way. Antacids, like we talked about before, they buffer acid after production, and then they start having negative implications on how we digest foods and and take up nutrients. So we don't necessarily want to jump straight to Pepto-Bismol and Tums and all these different things, especially chronically. Uh, We talked about zinc and B12, but they also eliminate the ability of of calcium to be absorbed. And in fact, I, I feel like Tums used to come out with one that had calcium built in because of that. 
Do you remember seeing like the Tums with calcium? I remember, yeah. Yeah, and that's for some why. reason that's like wedged into my brain. Yeah, and it's like, why on earth would you need to add calcium? Well, because it, you, you can no longer absorb some of these nutrients as you take these antacids. And I'm not so sure that that's very effective, just lumping it on with the thing causing the problem. So let me ask you, between these things, like, where would you start? Would you start with the elimination diet, or would you start with the supplementation of zinc and some of the other nutrients? Honestly, it would depend on what types of symptoms they're having. You know, if there's growth issues, if there's poor wound healing, if they're picky eaters, I'm going to start with the zinc. If it's gut irritation and things like that, constipation, diarrhea, I'm going to start with dairy and gluten. Uh, If it's behavioral issues, dairy and gluten. That's a ton to consider, man. That's just a lot of info to keep straight. Like, I'm feeling like if I really wanted to internalize this, I'd have to just stop and listen to this episode again. (laughs) (laughs) It wouldn't hurt. Uh, And I would encourage people to pick up Dr. Kelly Dorfman's book, Cure Your Child with Food. Uh, This is kind of a simplified uh, version of that mixed with my experience with with clients over the years. It seems to me that if the majority of American kids are on the white diet, and I could think my kids growing up, for sure, that's what we fed them. Probably like the majority of people listening right now. It's what um, I grew up on. With you see all the extra chemicals and stuff that's putting in stuff now. Like yeah, the, and then dyes and things. Yeah, where we grew up on like, here's a bunch of milk, go nuts. Now we're like, here's snackables. Who knows what the heck's in here? <laughs> like, <laughs> Here's your color-changing <laughs> trick cereal. With, right. <laughs> which we would have loved to have. But yeah, absolutely. It wasn't a thing. It's the thing that feels so overwhelming as a parent is like, how in the heck do you then be the weird family. Cause I remember growing up, there were people that I look back now on that ate differently than everybody else. And we were kind of like, Oh, you don't want to go over to his house. Cause you're going to have to eat the weird food. <laughs> uh, but they probably didn't deal with all the, the stuff. And they, it's not that it was weird. It was just so countercultural. Right. And it can't be tough. There are some social constraints there that may make it difficult. I would just encourage you to push through because the health benefits are, are compounding. They're amazing. They're incredible. It's worth it. Yeah, uh, it's longevity, it's quality of life. And we barely even covered one of the, the things that makes it a lot easier growing up as a kid, which is by adopting a healthier way of eating and introducing better supplements and cutting out some of these things, you could see a significant decrease in obesity. Absolutely, which is probably the most prevalent thing we see. I mean, I think it's over 50% now, uh, kids with obesity. It's nuts, at least in our country. Yeah, and we all know kids are not nice to each other, and no. obesity does not help in that regard. Oh, kids are ruthless. I, I was chronically picked on. I mean, I, I had to go to the police station a few times to report bruises. and all, I mean, it was bad. Wow. So kids could be pretty mean. But, you know, that that's a big part of it, too. Uh, but, I, but my goal is through this series is just to educate our parents with actual practical things they can start implementing to, to make a difference in not just their kids' lives, but in your lives too. And it does take work. Remember, this show is about no shortcuts. Uh, there's no magic pill. And this is the long-term sustainable way uh, to do it. And you start with baby steps, not an overhaul. And we're going to keep laying down that process step by step here on The Fire Within. Thanks for tuning in today. I hope you got a lot of value out of today's episode. If you did, uh, go check us out at firewithinnf.com. You can subscribe to our newsletters and make sure you never miss an episode or any other content. Also, be sure to follow us on social media. 